하고 싶어 뒤맡기고 싶고 이런 시간들이 모여 피어나나 싶어 이어폰을 The first dish that I'll be cooking for my mukbang is karangmari, which is a Korean rolled egg omelet. To cook the dishes today, I went down to my dormitory kitchen, and for the karangmari, I started off by putting my frozen vegetables into a small microwaveable container and then pouring in some lukewarm water. I put the container into the microwave because I wanted it to cook a little, even though it was frozen fresh. And after that, I just drained the vegetables out in the sink. Next, I just put my pan onto the stove top and heated it up. I set the stove to around low to medium heat, and then I took some of the butter that I had in my fridge and heated it up as well. Here you can just see me taking it out and scooping in a few spoonfuls of butter. I wanted it to be extra flavorful. And then in a separate bowl, I cracked in two large eggs. I think it's the perfect serving size for one person. And then I just mixed it together with some regular salt and pepper. Once the pan is all heated with the butter, I just put in all of the vegetables and gave it a good mix just to make sure that it's going to be coated evenly and cooked through. When I felt like the vegetables were ready, I poured in the egg mixture, and as you can see here, all of the vegetables got pushed to the side. So I tried to save it a little and push it back into the middle and spread it around so that it's not all in one place. After you do that, you just want to try to roll up the egg roll and make your best attempt at it. If you can't tell, I kind of struggled with it, so you might need like another cooking utensil, like the chopstick that I'm using aside from your spatula. And in the end, I think it turned out pretty good. And this is what my egg roll looks like at the end. I think it actually is not that bad, not too shabby, especially for something that's being cooked in the dorm kitchen. I gave it a few pats and transferred it into this container because I needed to bring it back upstairs to my room. The next dish that I'll be cooking is the rapoki, and I ended up not using the dumplings because it was just too time consuming, but all the basic ingredients are there. You have the rice cakes, the scallions, cheese, and ramen. And for the ramen, I used the basic shin ramen, which is one of my favorite brands actually. I think it's super chewy and it has a great texture. And what you want to do is boil some water and put in the ramen, cook it in the pan, a pot, whatever you're using to cook your tteokbokki and ramen in. Once the water began to boil a little bit more, I started breaking up the ramen to make sure that it can cook through evenly, and then I added in a sauce pack. To give the ramen a little bit more umami flavor, I also decided to add in some fish bonito flakes, which is a Japanese flavoring soup base, and I mixed it all together and waited for the ramen to cook. While the ramen was cooking, I also decided to prep my tteokbokki, and I bought it in this prepackaged form, which is super easy to cook as well, and I just took it out with all of the tteokbokki rice cakes and the sauce packets. First, you want to make sure that you're following the instructions. So for my package, it says to rinse the tteokbokki and make sure that it's clean, so I just ran it under some tap water after washing the rice cakes, I then just drained out the water in the sink. I then saw that my ramen was done cooking, so I transferred it into a bowl so I could begin prepping the tteokbokki. You want to pour in some boiling water into your pan or pot and wait for it to reach this boiling point, and then I just dumped in all of the rice cakes into the water. Immediately following this step, I took the two sauce packets that were provided with me and then began to pour the powder in. Now I think this might be a rookie mistake on my part, but it turned out to be really spicy, so I'd suggest that you put in as much as you think you could tolerate. But I just put in both of the sauce packets because I thought that was the best option at the time and just waited for it to boil and reach this really nice rich color. After the tteokbokki was done cooking, I just brought everything back up into my room and began mixing the tteokbokki and the ramen together. To help balance out the spice, it's suggested that you also put in some cheese, so that's what I did. This is just regular shredded mozzarella cheese. To give the rapoki a little bit more color, I also added on some fresh green scallions. Now the next dish I have here is just some kimchi radish, but I actually bought this at the store, so I won't show the cooking process for it. Hi everyone, welcome to my mukbang. My name is Kim and I wanted to create this mukbang because in order to celebrate May, which is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, I thought what better way to share my own Asian American experience by eating food and talking to you guys. So first I want to introduce all the foods that I have right here in front of me. I have rapoki, garden, mari, and 
kimchi radish. Sorry for butchering the names of these dishes. I want to share why these foods are important to me. Despite being Taiwanese American, these three foods in front of me have really influenced me as a teenager and as an Asian American growing up because it exposed me to the Korean culture. So for ropoki, which is this dish right here, it consists of the ingredients rice cakes, which is topoki in Korean, as well as ramen noodles, and it's usually instant ramen. This dish is really popular in Bunshik Jip, which is a Korean local snack shop where a lot of high schoolers and teenagers would usually go after school, and it's a really popular street food as well. For the history of tteokbokki, which is the Korean rice cakes, it actually was traced back to the late Joseon dynasty, and tteokbokki was a part of the Korean royal court cuisine back then. And during this time, unlike the modern version of tteokbokki, which is red and spicy, the original version was actually brown and plain, which I found surprising when I was doing my research. And the courts ate tteokbokki with a combination of tteok, which I believe is the rice component of the rice cake, as well as meat, vegetables, and different kinds of seasoning. After the introduction of gochujang, the Korean paste made its way into what we now know as ropoki, and it basically made tteokbokki, ropoki, all these different variations into this red and colorful dish that we know today. As for this Korean omelet, which is a rolled egg with a bunch of vegetables in it, it is called gyeonmari, and it's a popular banchan side dish in Korea. It's often served with rice, and it's also a really popular dish for lunch boxes, for children who are packing lunch boxes. For Korean people, it's really delicious and it's really nutritious as well. As for the Korean radish kimchi over here, it is called kadugi. The name originates from karok and sogi, seolgi in Korean, which describes the motion of cutting food into cubes. And as you can see here, it's actually like little cubes as well. So I really like it. It's really crunchy, it has a nice texture to it. And many Koreans say that this Korean radish is actually tastes the best when it's harvested around October to December. So around that time period, basically radishes picked during this time would have like the most natural sweet taste and also a lot firmer. Well, kimchi radish is commonly paired with other dishes as well, such as Korean oxbone soup, beef short rib soup, and also Korean knife cup noodles. Now before we start eating, I know it's going to be really spicy and I'm really low spice tolerant, so I got some Sprite here and my metal straw, you gotta be sustainable. Wow. Mm. Okay, so first, let's try this ropoki dish. Mmm! Oh my god. That's spicy. That's spicy, okay. <laughs> Let's try this rice cake. Mmm! Oh, that's really good. Now let's try the Korean egg omelet. Wait, that's really good. Okay, so this is kind of like sweet and salty, and this is like kind of spicy and sweet. And the spiciness of the ropoki and the egg kind of pair really well together. Mm. All right. Now let's try this radish kimchi. This is what it looks like. It's basically a cube, so. Mm, really crunchy. I don't know if you guys are hearing that, but yeah. I wanted to first delve into like my childhood and like growing up. What I was kind of like as an Asian American. I would say that as a child, I was definitely kind of the nerdy type in school. And I was the one who always did my homework. And I really didn't play that many video games or like play sports. I'm very unathletic still to this day. And I think that this entire like notion of the model minority myth is kind of what I basically developed in elementary school, at least like subconsciously, because um, besides from like being a nerd and stuff like that, my parents always sent me to like piano lessons and swimming lessons. Like all of the typical kinds of like stereotypical Asian hobbies that one would think of. 
And while I do like love these activities that I did, it kind of was a way for my parents to have me differentiate myself from like my classmates. But like at an early age, like, I guess it did help me differentiate myself. It also played into the model minority myth. And of course my parents obviously don't really know the model minority myth because they're first generation immigrants. Looking back, those activities were kind of what defined me and kind of shaped me into this model minority even though I wasn't even thinking about it, so, you yeah. know. Hopefully that made sense because the spiciness is kind of getting to me, but what I'm saying is, as a child, the activities I thought made me special and that I enjoyed actually played into the bigger model minority stereotype. And I didn't know why that was so bad. Like, I knew that like what I was doing was very similar to all my other Asian peers, but I didn't know why it was bad to be called a model minority until like recently, like in recent years. Like, being a model minority doesn't just kind of like serve to uplift like Asian Americans, but it actually is really detrimental to other like communities of color, especially when you're comparing other communities of color to Asian people and you're like, why? If Asian people could do it with all of these like racism and like structures in place, then why can't this XYZ group do it? And I think you can't compare different groups like that. And it's just really detrimental to like compare like your struggles and privileges. Also, when you're calling Asian people like model minorities, it kind of just shields like underrepresented, underprivileged Asian like Americans as well. Because in the broader sense, Asian American is such a big term that encompasses so many different, I guess, Asian subgroups, if you know what I mean. And to do that, it's like there's so many different socio socioeconomic disparities. Um, with between all of these different nationalities, ethnicities, and stuff like that. Like, you can't just say, like, all Asian people are, are this successful and stuff like that, because at the end of the day, that's not true, and the model minority myth hides all of this. Like, it's saying, if Asians could do it, why can't this group do it? And if Asians are so successful, like, st statistically, then, like, we don't really have to, like, concern them as much as a underprivileged group. So I think that plays, that in it of itself is like a really complex topic. For me, like, I think one of the biggest turning points in terms of my own Asian American identity was definitely going to high school. Like I went to high school where it was 60% Asian. I actually discovered more of my Asian American identity and I guess I didn't really talk about this before as well, but like my parents definitely wanted me to take my culture and my second language, which is Chinese, very seriously. So I went to like Chinese school on the weekends. Despite knowing like my language, I didn't really venture into exploring Taiwan and like Chinese pop culture in general. So I remember this really distinctly, like my friend, he introduced me to K-pop actually um, on the school bus. The video he introduced me to was BTS's Save Me. And immediately like I fell in love with like K-pop because I was like, what is all of this dancing and music and choreography? And then I kind of went to this rabbit hole of just discovering like the entire like K like culture in general through YouTube recommendations. Like they would show me like variety shows and like different food tours of like Korea. And then through that I was like, I oh, maybe I'll like try out all of these different foods. And that's how I like found Ropoki and Gurumari and like the kimchi radish. Because living in like New York City where there's so many different varieties of foods and cuisines that I could choose from, like I had all of these Asian foods as well in close proximity. So being able to try it and experience that as well was like really eye-opening. And I think that's like the biggest effect of like the How You Wave and its impact on Asian Americans, like myself. And I saw like people who kind of like looked like me um, being represented in the media. And I think that's what shaped my identity as an Asian American and my perspective of like the power and like the influence that we could hold. K-culture and like K-pop, K-dramas has exposed me to this whole new other world where I could kind of take on a whole new part of myself. It has helped like redefine 
like fashion and like music and stuff like that in the terms of we could see ourselves in it so for me like i've gotten a lot of like my inspiration for like my clothing now from korean idols or actors just seeing someone in the media who like kind of looked like me and thought was really inspiring i hope you guys enjoyed today's mukbang i know it was kind of all over the place but i think i just needed to share why i believe like my asian american experience as well as how that kind of ties into uh, k-pop k-dramas and the food as well everything has been so delicious and i'll see you guys next time